So very warm welcome to you all to this uh, Q&A on inclusive marketing uh, communications and how to do it and why it really matters. Um, so before we get into the content of today's uh, today's session, I'd like to welcome today's sponsor, um, Barclays Eagle Lab. So these Q&As are brought to you with Barclays support. And I'd like to invite Luca Forte to um, say a few words about, um, about the labs and what you do to support businesses. So over to you, Luca. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Luca um, and I'm an Eagle Lab, uh, Eagle Lab Lab Manager from Brighton, looking after our, our Brighton space here. Um, we're situated just on Preston Circus, which a lot of you may know already. And for those of you that don't know about us already, just going to spend just a quick minute or two just talking about what we do and what we offer. Um, as a lot has changed as well since the last time you may have heard about us. And um, thank you again, Amy, for letting us sponsor this. These great sessions are amazing. Um, and these are always the sort of thing that we want to sort of be involved in. So um, brilliant. Um, thank you so much for letting us uh, come along today. So um, Eagle Labs, we support um, all sorts of businesses in their growth and their uh, ambitions to grow. So we support startups, uh, established businesses, tech businesses, entrepreneurs, from idea stage all the way through to um, businesses that have been have been running for years now. Um, but we aim to support them in, in like I said, to, to us, uh, aspire to grow as much as possible. So we are essentially a co-working space slash incubator. Um, we used to be a branch, which you may remember us as many years ago, but now we're a cool um, co-working space. Um, that has uh, flexible working as well as offices and meeting rooms and, and all sorts of space in there. It also has a designated maker space with uh, an engineer, which is something that I'd encourage people to come and see rather than me try and explain it. But it's got all sorts of good technology as well as like a, uh, an on-site engineer to help support with any sort of tech and prototyping needs that you might have. Um, in terms of the sort of business support we offer, we're pretty industry agnostic in terms of like who we work with. There's, we, we'd, we'd encourage you to come and have a chat with ourselves about what we can offer to you. You know, we really like to get to know a business and, and the people behind it to be able to identify what support we can give. So we can offer things such as free mentoring for mentors, such as the largest tech incubator in Europe, all the way through to um, individual mentors like the, the founder of Huel and, and Grazed. And um, so there's some really good mentoring that is available to businesses such as yourselves. Um, all the way through to funding support, so we run um, programs around how to get funding, around different types of funding. Um, and then, um, as I said, the sort of on-site on support with connections and, and building a community here. So we're here to sort of support businesses like you in any way that we can. So um, I'd really encourage anyone to, that would be interested in sort of hearing more to um, tap myself up for a chat or my, or my colleague Naomi. I'm sure details will be passed around after this and, uh, and we'd love to hear more from you. Um, I guess one, one caveat is that, is that you don't need to bank with Barclays, so don't feel like you do. Just because we're called Barclays doesn't mean that you need to bank with us um, in order to receive the support. So always remember that. Um, and one thing that I'd love to offer everyone on this call today is a, is a month's free trial. So if you ever need to get out of the house, if you want to get out a bit more, um, bored of sitting in the same four walls or want to try something a bit different, We'd love to offer everyone here today a, um, a free month's trial in terms of coming and trialing our space. So take us up on that as well. Um, but thank you very much. I'll, I'm going to stop talking there because I can ramble on for ages if I'm given the opportunity to. And we can look forward to hearing from Ellie today. Thank you so much, Luca. Thanks, Ellie. Um, yeah, we will absolutely send around details of how to get in touch with you or the team afterwards um, and also details of how you can access that free month's co-working very generous offer um, and um, the bonus I would say is if you did come in and, and, and do some co-working at Barclays Eagle Labs is the chamber team are based there as well um, so we're in there a few days a week so you can always come and stop by and have a cup of tea with us as well so um Thank you so much, Luca. Um, I am absolutely delighted now to welcome Ellie Thompson as today's expert. So Ellie is Senior Communications Officer at Diversity and Ability. Divers Diversity and Ability is a social enterprise led for, led by and for disabled people. They support individuals, organisations and social justice projects to foster diverse and inclusive cultures. Let's get started. So, um, big first question. Um, why do you need to think about inclusive communications? 
yeah, it is a big question and quite like a multifaceted answer, I'd say as well. Um, just quickly, I wanted to say hello as well. Um, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, this is really like a personal passion for me as well as my profession as someone who does inclusive communications for my work, but also needs them myself as a disabled and neurodiverse person. Um, so that's why I'm always really excited when people want to learn more about how to make their communications inclusive. Um, so I guess you're already kind of past the first hurdle of realising that it's important. But I do think it's still good to kind of look at why this is worth doing. Um, and yeah, there really are so many reasons. So firstly, there's, you know, there's, um, there's guidelines that every person who uses the web and puts uh, material out on, into the world um, should be following. Um, and those are the web content accessibility guidelines. And they give us everything we need to know in terms of how to make sure that we're creating content that is accessible and inclusive to as many people as possible. Um, so there's that kind of meeting, um, meeting best practice guidelines is the first kind of reason why it's worth doing. Secondly, before we get onto the kind of the real reason, it's also really great for your for your organization, for your business, for your for your reach um, as, as an organization. Um, the more accessible your content is and the more you follow those web content accessibility guidelines, the more you'll be rewarded by um, search engines, by um, algorithms on social media. So as an example, alt text, which is something we're going to talk about later, is really important for your search engine optimization for your SEO. Um, if you're, when we talk about um, making things that are accessible in terms of their audio, creating a transcript for a podcast means that you get all your amazing keywords and everything that you're discussing in that podcast out and searchable. So there's a real kind of business benefit to it in that sense as well. And finally, I think really when we talk about making things more inclusive, and we're thinking about how to motivate to do that, it's quite useful to flip the question around and think about who you're excluding at the moment. So who are you not including in your communications? Who's not gonna be able to access them? And what are the costs associated with that in, in so many different ways? So although obviously there's a legal and an ethical reason for including everyone and making things as accessible as you can, there is also a business one. It means that you can reach diverse customers and communities. I can see that there are a lot of people joining from other social enterprises and charities. For us, that might mean that we're um, able to reach people who aren't traditionally kind of um, able to access the internet or access social media, who have learned that those things aren't accessible to them. And those people are really, really important for us to reach out to and for us to be able to access. Um, so there's a real kind of benefit for charities and small um, businesses for good as well. And basically just letting organisations and individuals know that there's space for them in whatever you're offering to them, whether that's businesses, whether you're working with customers, whether you're looking for service users, it's letting them know that they're going to be able to access everything that you're providing. Um, and yeah, and just kind of really increasing your outreach and reaching a more diverse audience as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ellie. On to our next question. How can we ensure that communications are visually accessible? Yeah, so this really, I think this exemplifies how much this is kind of a whistle stop tour. Um, and also when we talk about making things accessible, um, I'd be really wary of using a word like fully accessible um, because that kind of idea of something being 100% accessible doesn't really exist. But what we can do is make sure that we're making our content as accessible as we possibly can um, and making sure that people have multiple options in terms of how they can access it. So in terms of visually accessible, um, the first thing to think about is your font. So always look for a font that's 12 points or larger. Um, ideally kind of 18, especially if you're making um, something that's like a, a, a picture of text or something like that. Um, a sans serif font, um, so something like Arial. Basically, um, if you're not familiar with fonts and things like that, the serif fonts are more traditional ones like Times New Roman that have the little flares on the ends of the letters, whereas sans serif um, are much more easier to access. They are more closely resemble um, how we write with our handwriting, so it's got an advantage there. Um, and if you're looking to emphasize particular portions of text using bold to do that, rather than capitals or italics or underlining, the latter three all change the way that those words look and that letters look, whereas bold just really emphasizes it. So that really gives you an advantage there. 
Um, color contrast is really important. And this is something that's really carefully laid out by those web content accessibility guidelines. There are some really useful um, guidelines online in terms of whether your content is meeting the accessibility guidelines in terms of contrast. But the key really is to think about having a high contrast between background text and the foreground, uh, background colour and the foreground text. And then making sure that that's really high contrast. Um, there'll probably be quite a significant difference between the two colours um, so that the content is visually accessible in that sense. Um, in terms of the, the kind of next three points, those are all about making sure that what you're putting across is very easily understood and processed. So thinking about making content that's linear as much as possible so that your eye can clearly follow down a path, making sure that headings are really clear and describe the context of what the rest of the text is going to go on to talk about or the rest of the, the kind of visuals are going to show. And then finally, camel case for hashtags. Um, so basically what that means is that the first letter of each word in a hashtag is capitalized um, and that's really important for um, for you know anyone to visually access um, what you've written but especially people who might use screen readers and um, screen readers won't be able to distinguish between words when there's no space in between them unless those words are capitalized so a really important example I've seen over the past few years is the hashtag black lives matter um, when it's not capitalized is read out by my screen reader as black slivs matter or slivs matter, whatever it is, it's complete nonsense. Um, and it just really dilutes the, the meaning and the content of your post. And it's such an easy fix. So um, Camel Case would be my kind of final recommendation on that note. Amazing. Thank you, Ali. There's plenty of pra really practical, um, really practical things and, and very easy things in there to, for people to start with. Right. The, yeah. the, it doesn't take much. I remember after a conversation with you, I immediately changed my font to 14, um, you know, and, and that made, made a difference to me as well. You know, I was thinking exactly. why am I reading this was such a small thing. Um, Right, let's move on. I, and I'd just like to take this opportunity to say and remind everyone, please do send any comments, any um, questions that you have through in the chat. I'm keeping an eye on that as well as we go forward. So, how can we ensure communications have accessible audio? Great, so another really important point, I guess kind of the other side of that same coin. Um, so the first thing is to use closed captions as much as possible. Um, so that's subtitles, which also describe kind of contextual sounds as well. Um, so any relevant contextual sounds. If you were to watch um, a film or a TV show with subtitles on, um, you'd notice that they actually use closed captions. So that's something like rain um, or, you know, the name of a song that's playing. Um, and that's just really useful for um, people, for deaf people, for people who are hard of hearing, but also for anyone who might process audio in a slightly different way. Um, I really benefit from, from captions myself, um, despite the fact that I'm not hard of hearing, I'm not deaf, um, just because it helps me to process audio um, content. So it's a really kind of, again, quite an easy win. Um, if you're creating pre-recorded content, it's really important to make sure that the transcripts are as accurate as they can be. So, for example, for a podcast, having a written transcript alongside your podcast is going to really open up the number of people who are able to access those conversations and access that really important info that you're trying to share. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's also really great for SEO because everything that you're saying is, is written out. It means that people can search for that information and find it. Um, so that's a real win-win kind of situation there. Um, keeping background noise to a minimum is really important. So in everything from Zoom meetings to videos to podcasts to phone calls, really think about the background noise because that's something that can really affect anyone who um, experiences sensory overload, anyone who experiences um, who is deaf or hard of hearing, anyone who processes audio differently. And that includes music. So really think about if you are creating video content, how you use music, any background music is going to dilute uh, our ability to process the, the audio content that we need to hear. So just be really mindful of that. Um, making sure you speak clearly and at a natural pace as well. So I think that's really important when we think about kind of if you were to think about creating content for, for deaf people specifically. Um, there is a part of us sometimes that might feel like we need to speak differently to the way we usually do to overemphasize our words. Um, if we know someone's lip reading, to shout even. Don't do any of that. Um, just speak clearly at a normal pace, um, just you know, in your natural voice. And that's the best way to make sure that you're speaking in an accessible way. 
Um, and finally, I think really a good quick tip is that YouTube does have automated captioning. So if you upload a YouTube video, you will automatically have um, closed captions available for that. It might take a little bit of time to process, but they will be there. So what we tend to do as a very small team with limited capacity, often for our captioning, that's what we'll do is whatever we're creating, we'll upload it to YouTube to take advantage of that closed captioning. And um, crucially, though, make sure that you correct it. The captioning is pretty accurate, but it's very, very important that a caption is fully accurate. So take the time to go through, correct any grammar errors. If there's any kind of jargon or acronyms you're using, those kind of things can get easily kind of muddied. So making sure to go back through um, and make sure it is fully accurate and just use that as a bit of a leg up to, um, to get you started rather than you having to transcribe from scratch. Thanks, Sally. On the transcripts for pre-recorded content, mm. Are there some good kind of programs out there that, that do that and do it well? Yes, so um, there's a program called Descript, which is great. I personally use Otter, um, which I think maybe more people have heard of since the, um, since the pandemic and since everything kind of going online. Um, but Otter AI is a really great um, speech to text program. Um, there is a free version where you can upload, I think it's 45 minutes of content and it will automatically transcribe that. Once you get the pay version, you have pretty much unlimited. Um, and Otter is really advanced. So if you have multiple people speaking, it will identify different voices, things like that. Um, also, if you are someone who, who has access to Premiere Pro, whether you're creating video or audio content and um, with Adobe Premiere Pro, they now have automated transcription. Um, so again, that is something you have to go through and correct. But I think often with these things, um, it's about getting, yeah, getting a head start on that rather than just typing from scratch. So Otter, um, the YouTube one is great. And um, if you do have access to Premiere Pro, I'd, I'd take advantage of that automated transcription as well. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Um, great. I'm just going to check the chat to see if we've got anything. Haven't had anything come through yet. Clearly, you're covering everything everyone <laughs> needs to know. Um, I've got a question about visual comms and, and some um, uh, and accessibility checkers, but I'll ask that at the end. Um, so, um, right, let's move on to our next our next question. Um, so, what can we do as as people as businesses to make our language and imagery more inclusive? Yeah, so um, I think uh, the reason I've started with nothing about us without us, so that's a disability justice mantra um, that was originally um, from South Africa's anti-apartheid movement. I don't know if anyone watched the BBC show um, Then Barbara Matt Allen, which was on TV this week. If you haven't, I'd really recommend it. It's amazing. Um, and, and that's the story of kind of the start of the Direct Action Network for Disabled People. Um, but the reason I want to start by emphasising nothing about us without us is the best way to make your language and your Im imagery more inclusive, um, not just for disabled people, but, but for everyone, is to take time to kind of uphold the voices that are explaining what they need to feel included. So obviously, you've all made a great start on that by coming along today. Um, but really just making sure that you're taking the time to amplify different voices and to listen and to really hear what they're telling you in terms of how to make things more inclusive and then to include them in your content as well. Um, so in terms of specific vocabulary for us, um, as an organisation and as individuals, the language disabled people, not people with disabilities, is really important to us. Um, that's to do with the fact that we you know, believe in a social model of disability where we're disabled by the barriers that are put in place around us rather than by anything that's wrong with us or that we need to fix or cure. Um, that's the same with kind of with deaf people with a capital D often um, because that's a, that's a real community um, that people identify with and they don't see that as an impairment. I think we've really em exemplified that today as well because if you create let's say a video with closed captions everyone can access that whereas in the Whereas if you created a video without those captions, you're only a, only a certain amount of people will be able to access it. So there you've done something really quick and simple to remove a major access barrier um, and you've removed in a way that disabling barrier um, and reach more people. Um, so I think, you know, ex exclusionary vocabulary and analogies, removing those from your from your vocabulary sounds like a big task. Um, I actually think that this is somewhere where the government's guidelines can really help. They have a guide to inclusive language, um, which is pretty up to date in terms of how we would like to be referred to. Um, so that can give you a good starting place. And in terms of analogies, that's things like 
um, you know, fallen on deaf ears or um, the blind leading the blind, um, exclusionary vocabulary, even includes things like saying things are crazy or mad or insane. All of those are very, very small things that signal to us that we might not be included in that space. So just really take the time to think more mindfully about what your language might be saying. Um, using diverse and representative stock images, I think, is another kind of real easy win. Um, there are some really great resources out there. Um, I can send them around after because there's this a great list that I've been accumulating um, for a few years now. Um, one that comes to mind is um, by a group called Disabled and Here. Um, and those are completely free stock images featuring disabled people. Um, it's from uh, America, so uh, they feature, um, or they, the language they use is that they feature Black, Indigenous and people of colour who are also disabled. Um, they've also started including some free artwork there as well, so some illustrations that are diverse and inclusive. Um, and there are so many more resources along those lines as well. Um, covering all different aspects of our diverse lived experience. So that's another thing where you can really make a difference. Um, and finally, image descriptions. So I've got another slide which is all about image descriptions. Um, I think, yeah, so image descriptions basically, um, you may have started to notice more over social media, maybe over the past few years. It's really important for your website for emails that you might send, even just to your colleagues, um, if they're including images. Um, but basically an image description quite simply describes an image so that people who may not be able to visually access the image can still access that content, the meaning behind it, um, and kind of benefit from what you're trying to portray with that image. Um, so I'll pause for a second, um, just in case anyone has any questions before we move into a very slightly deeper dive into image description specifically. I just wanted to comment, Ellie, that I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the inclusive language guidelines, that there's something out there that, that will help, because I think having done a few of these um, Q&As on a variety of different topics, I think some of the questions that come up are, what is the right language? You know, what, what is the right term to use um, that is going to be inclusive? Um, so it's great that there's some, some guidelines out there. I think that help, help is a helpful starting point. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, kind of th those are things that are evolving as well. And I think maybe, you know, the language that we've been using our for ourselves has been set for a very long time, but we maybe haven't been listened to for a very, very long time. Um, so I think inclusive language is something that's still evolving. I know that even, you know, since I started in my role, we've shifted some of the ways that we talked about, uh, you know, ourselves and, um, and the people that we work with. Um, so it is really important to kind of keep up to date. Um, but you know that also know that it's okay to get it wrong and be gently corrected and learn from that. I think that's really, really important um, because we all know that language is evolving and that we're finally having the space to listen to how people actually want to be talked about and how they want to be included. And we haven't had that in the past. So just kind of being ready to have that slightly uncomfortable feeling of maybe getting it wrong and then learning from that and, you know, doing better. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we um, being uncomfortable is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Um, sometimes, as you say, it, it can really make an impact on the, on the change that you can have. Exactly. We've had a, a good question come through, um, I guess, in relation to, you know, you were talking about stock images and making sure that your, your imagery is inclusive. How how do we avoid that tokenistic um, of, approach? Because there might be, you know, I'm not saying people on the, on this call whatsoever, but, you know, using imagery which don't doesn't kind of reflect their values as a company. Um, uh, so have you got any advice on, on that side of things? Or Yeah, I, and that's, a, you're right, that's a really great question. And, and in some ways, I guess, a bit of a, a tightrope walk, but I think the way that you've kind of contextualised that, Amy, is, is the crucial part is making sure that the images that you're using and the way you're using them reflect your genuine values and actions as an organisation. So again, that's something that you've exemplified by coming along today. Um, one thing that, that I would find really jarring as, you know, as a disabled person is, is if I were to see an image of a disabled person on a social media platform, let's say on Instagram, where that image hadn't been image described, where the there was text that I couldn't access, you know, things that really show that this is just about kind of face value diversity rather than genuine inclusion. So I think, you know, as long as you're really taking this as 
um, an all-inclusive approach. If you're thinking about kind of your recruitment practices and how to make sure they're inclusive, if you're thinking about ways that you can make sure if you do have a staff team that your staff feel included, that that their work is accessible to them, that you're kind of meeting them um, and welcoming whatever they, they bring to their work. Um, if you're thinking about how you communicate outwardly in an accessible and inclusive way, then you can, you know, use photos that, that demonstrate that you're, you know, really committed to inclusion. So I think really the key is just thinking about this as part of, you know, a, a really kind of complex puzzle that you're working on at the moment. Um, and I think also it's one of those things where by asking the question, you're aware that that is a risk. Um, so asking the question is, is a good sign that you're committed to getting it right. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's nice to see it asked. And I think just make sure that that it's kind of um, a holistic, but you know, um, but that you're mirroring the way you act in, in all different areas of the way you work. I think that is really the key thing. Brilliant. Thank you, Ellie. Right, you can now jump into image descriptions. Yes. So um, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, image descriptions are very simply a, a description of an image and um, that's slightly different to the alt text which I mentioned before which would usually be kind of hidden kind of in code so on websites if you upload an image there should be a way to add alt text to your um to your image um we kind of um use them in social media terms slightly interchangeably just because um, I think the important thing is that people understand the basics of how to create an image description and where to put them as well. Um, so I've written, I've put a link here to a guide which is how to add alt text and image descriptions to any of your posts across different social media platforms. So definitely check that out because I um, I could, you know, sit here and go through them all practically and, you know, maybe that would be beneficial, but it would take a while. Um, so I think the key thing is we get the guidance on how to create them. Um, the formula object action context, I find can be really useful for starting how you think about image descriptions. Um, really just take a step back from the image that, that you've got in front of you and think about where are you looking first? What is the key feature of that? How is it interacting with the things around it? And then finally, what is the kind of context around that as well? Um, so for example, on this one, we have the DNA team. So that's the, the kind of object outside their office in Brighton. They're walking or wheeling towards the camera um, and that's then the, the action, but are looking at each other, chatting and smiling as they go. They are a diverse mix of ages, races, disabilities and genders. Um, so that and that, that kind of final aspect is important as well. Um, so making sure to describe kind of how, how someone looks in, in a very like um, inclusive way. Um, so if you know gender, if you know race or skin colour, those are really important things to add. Um, there's a really amazing article I read recently um, about um, the impact of having um, a black person ha having themselves described as black in their image description. Um, and Heben Gama, who is a deafblind um, human rights lawyer and kind of disability justice advocate, has said that she, you know, is as a black woman, she is so used to fellow blind people assuming that she's white and um, so she now always you know when she's describing herself when other people are describing her ask them to include it um, and it's just about kind of removing the the assumption that someone would be white or removing our assumptions based on how they talk about what their gender might be um, but in that within that context it's very very important to not guess so if you don't know the information about someone's gender or their race or their skin color not including that and um, facial expressions can be really key as well. So when you're thinking about the image content, thinking about kind of who's looking where and what are they doing and what does that mean? Um, so that's why we you know, mentioned that these people are chatting and smiling because that's really important context for the photo. Um, and just um, there's a final kind of very small quick fix to avoid words related to sight. Now that's really specific for image descriptions. So in general, you don't need to worry about kind of say if you were talking about a wheelchair user, they, you know, saying that they went for a walk, that that information is totally fine. Um, however, in this specific context, when you're first writing an image description, you might have a tendency to say something like, um, in the background, you can see some, um, some trees with no leaves on. Um, obviously, the person who's reading that image description may well not be able to see that. So just thinking about how you can use different words to, to kind of recognise who might be benefiting from that image description. So just keeping an eye on that kind of quick, quick fix there as well. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Sally. Um, we've had uh, somebody say that they really recommend um, uh, the book um, by um, Harbin Germa as well. So, yes, got a big fan here as well. Um, right, I've got a couple of questions coming in, but I'll ask you a final question now, Ellie, if that's all right. Yeah, of course. Um, so, um, are the guidelines the same for every social media platform in terms of accessible communication? Um, I would say broadly yes and more specifically no um, so really thinking about kind of the context for for what those things are so I've, I've just seen that I've made an error on that side so for Twitter your image descriptions don't have to be as rich um, so they can be quite short you have um, the ability to add alt text into when you upload the photo and because on Twitter we're talking about very short form um, content Oh, I see what I've done. I've mixed up the Twitter and the Instagram ones. Uh, apologies for that. So, um, yeah, add the old text before you post those photos with the understanding that you're looking at very short form context there. Um, as uh, hashtags are still really kind of important on Twitter, remembering the camel case. Um, there's some really amazing bots out there on Twitter. So at alt text reminder is a really good one. Um, and if you post a photo without an image description, you'll get a DM instantly, which tells you that you've done that. And then you can reply to your own tweets, adding an image description, or you can delete and re-upload. So it's really get great for getting into the practice of doing that. Um, using emojis sparingly as well. So a screen reader will read out the description of each emoji. So when you have trends like, um, the kind of trend where everyone was putting a clapping hand sign in between each word of a tweet that reads out absolutely awfully it's horrific to hear you know um so just being mindful of when you when you think about what your text would look like imagine that you were reading out each image uh, each emoji as well and you'll understand what that content will will uh, sound like to someone using a screen reader um, for, for Twitter, so for Instagram then, you can use richer image descriptions because we're talking about a very visual platform and it's right to replicate that in the way that you do your image descriptions too. Um, in terms of Instagram stories, we now all have the ability to add captions. So uploading the closed captions, which is just a sticker that you can add on when you're creating your stories. Um, some GIFs can be really strobing. So avoiding anything that strobes um, that, and, and being mindful of the font you use as well. So some of the Instagram story fonts are accessible. I always use the first one and then put the background on it as well so that the content can be kind of easily read. Um, just as a kind of side note, image um, Instagram stories cannot be visually accessible. They can't be accessed by screen readers at all. So if you're talking about really important information, make sure you put that in your, um, in your feed as well so that someone who um, benefits from a screen reader is still able to access that. And add your image descriptions into the captions of your post, put them at the end, and then your hashtags if you do use them after that as well so that everyone can see that you're using image descriptions and benefit from them if they need them. And um, finally, for LinkedIn and Facebook, those have got really similar, really quick guidelines. Um, add the alt text before posting your photos, which is, um, I um, mentioned the guide on how to do that. And write a written image description in the content of the post as well. Keep the hashtags to the end so that anyone using a screen reader can then skip through them. They don't have them kind of um, muddied through the body of the content. Um, and those are kind of, yes, some very quick, very fast paced tips on, on some of the, the kind of more subtle differences between the different platforms. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ellie. Um, that's brilliant. Um, I think, yeah, it's, with, with these Q&As, it's, it's always a whistle stop tour. Yeah. I know we'll be sending around um, some of these useful guidelines that you've mentioned afterwards as well. So um, I think it's great just to encourage people to get started, make some quick, quick changes um, for sure as well. And then and then explore a bit more. And I guess that's where organisations like you as well step in is to help people really take it further. <clears throat> As well. Um, so we've had a couple of questions come through that I'd really like to ask. Um, so um, I'm just re, uh, we've got one. Um, uh, so somebody's just built their uh, website on Squarespace. Um, so they're not a designer, just a, um, a business owner who wants to get themselves out there. Can you recommend any software that they can run the website through just to check accessibility and then obviously make some changes? That's a great question. Obviously, my, my first recommendation is to get in contact with us. Um, so we do kind of web um, and communications audit, which will be fully adapted to the scope and scale and um, experience and kind of 
uh, context of your organization and your needs um, and that's going to be the best way to make sure that you really are meeting all those guidelines potentially even going above and beyond um, in terms of free and accessible kind of web checkers um, there definitely are some I can't think of off the top of my head um, so I will find a link to those the free ones tend to be very limited in their scope um, and the best way to do it is always going to be to to have some real user testing by people with lived experience who use screen readers who need to access um, content that's accessible so um, that's always kind of the best way to go about it but I will say around the kind of quick nice um, first step in terms of those those um, guides that take you through it kind of more um, automatically. Thanks Annie. Um, and another question is are there any best practice guidelines for live speech to text translation using Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams meeting? So best practice um, is always to have a live transcriber um, so making sure that you have someone in an event I think if you're ever running kind of a, a live paid for event like a conference or a larger scale talk it really is worth investing in that in terms of what you're signaling to people about whether this event is going to be inclusive to them um, in terms of what we do have access to for free and um, both Teams and Zoom and Google Meet now have free automated captioning. They vary in terms of their kind of actual kind of uh, clarity and um, accuracy. Um, I think Microsoft Teams um, is the best. Um, so kind of considering that, um, but there are other areas where Zoom kind of um, kind of takes over as, as the front runner. However, the Zoom captions are only available if you have a premium account. Um, if you if you do want to think a little bit more about access um, get in contact with zoom and let them know that that is not an inclusive process because um, accessibility isn't kind of a premium feature or shouldn't be a premium feature um, but if you do have zoom premium then you can add them as a live transcription and use them then think about how you can send how you can correct those before you send them out after an event um, so i think that's the best way to kind of combine maybe where you're at in terms of capacity um, and you know, um, financial um, capabilities with what's gonna be the most accessible is, is to just use the um, transcripts that are automated where you can and then think about recorrecting them afterwards and making sure that you do have one very accurate transcript available and um, for people who would benefit from that. Amazing, thank you, Ellie. Um, fantastic, some really, really helpful things in there. I'm just very conscious of time. So I've just um, flicked it onto our, our final slide um, where um, uh, encouraging you just to, to keep in touch with the diversity and ability team. They're a fantastic team. They do a lot with a very small number of you, isn't that right, Ellie? <laughs> um, but yeah, do, do check out the resources um, and we'll be sure to send around a few things um, afterwards. Um, so um, I just want to say a massive thank you to you, Ellie, for joining us today for those brilliant tips. I have been scribbling away myself um, because I know that there's some brilliant things in there that, that we can be doing better for sure. Um, and um, a very big thank you to Luca um, and Barclays Eagle Labs for being our sponsor um, today. Um, there are a few things I just wanted to, to let you know about. Um, we're continuing running these Q and A, so do keep an eye out for, for any future um, future sessions. Um, for those of you who are new to Brighton Chamber and perhaps aren't aware of, of the breadth of what we do, um, we are a non-profit and independent membership organisation with the aim of helping businesses, charities, and social enterprises. So a really inclusive group of, of organisations there in Brighton. Um, and if you found today's sessions useful, we do all sorts of events to help people network to learn. Um, and, and be part of a brilliant community so do do keep in touch with us on that um we have a uh, we've just launched a new series called the confident business series in, in collaboration with the uh, business and ip center in brighton and hove um, and always possible so delivering some great free support um, for businesses all sorts of different workshops on things to do with pitching pricing um, customers and tech and there's one-to-one -one sessions available so just wanted to put that out there to you all as well you do not have to be a chamber member to access any of that and it's all free um, so I'm going to let you go because I'm terribly four minutes over our time and I, I hate that um, but I just want to say yeah thank you for joining us today I hope you found it as useful as I have um, and we'll be in touch um, with further information I've had a couple of questions about sharing the presentation I will check that with Ellie and see what we can send you um, and we'll we'll go from there so have a great rest of your day and good rest of your week everyone thank you so much
Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.